Good evening, everyone. Thanks for join, joining the third of our coffee night speaker series, which we will look, look forward to be a fruitful exchange. My name is Ibrahim Anli, and I'm the executive director of Rumi Forum. Uh, for those who are not familiar with, with Rumi Forum, it's been active in doing interfaith work in DC area since 1999, with which a story that started with uh, mostly uh, reaching out to uh, Abrahamic faith communities, but uh, has been expanding since then. So we continue our work in the in the capital and uh, look forward to getting your feedback and uh, outreach on on this programs and uh, others to come so um, our speaker this evening is melissa rogers and our program will be moderated by one of our national board members jamia adams uh, thank you and uh, uh, Jamia, why don't you introduce our speaker? Sure, uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, uh, depending on what part of uh, the country you are in. Uh, I'm Jamia Adams, um, as Ibrahim said, uh, a national board member for Rumi Forum. Uh, today's coffee series, we have uh, Melissa Rogers, who is, uh, an expert on the First Amendment uh, rights and um, the author of um, uh, Faith in American Public Life, published, published last year. Uh, we're excited to have her on board speaking about um, these issues that we are talking about today, which is life confronting controversy, cultivating common ground. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Yeah, great. Well, thank you, Jamia, and thank you, Ibrahim and Kubra. I really appreciate your work um, individually and also the work of the Rumi Forum. I have really fond memories of being able to work with you all uh, on many occasions, including when I served at the White House and we worked together on certain events and, and efforts, and it was always uh, a joy and an honor to work with you all, and I appreciate what you do every day to bring people together across differences for conversation about um, issues where we agree and where we disagree. So thank you for that. Um, you, you really perform a great service. And it's so nice to see friends um, uh, spotted across the top of my screen here. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, so I'll get us started with just a few remarks. And then um, we can have, you know, uh, the conversation will follow. And when we talk about religion and public life, I think we always have both common ground and controversy. So that's two of the C's that are in the title. We also sometimes have a fair amount of confusion. <laughs> so I'm gonna add that C and just go through each C's with a couple of points on each one to get us started with conversation. The confusion I think about religion and public life can arise even about what those terms mean. When we're talking about religion, are we talking about all religions or how do people who are non-religious fit into the equation as well? Um, and what do we mean by public life? Um, I would say when I'm talking about um, these issues that certainly it would always be to recognize religion in the broadest sense um, and also to recognize that people of no faith have rights that are protected by our constitution. People who have beliefs and maybe, maybe even call themselves spiritual, but it would include those who are atheistic and agnostic um, to say that the first amendment protects their rights as well. And we wanna always honor that. What do we mean by public life? Well. In my um, definition, I'm trying to define it as broadly as possible, meaning any activity that's publicly visible. But sometimes people define that a little more narrowly to, to mean something that's involved with the government directly. So, so we'll talk about those things too, but I'm trying to conceive of the topic as broadly as possible. So that would mean everything from what we do with, on the front lawns of our houses of worship um, to what we do in co collaboration with government. 
Um, so it would basically include anything that can be publicly visible, anything that's not behind the closed doors of our houses of worship and our homes. And interestingly now with um, this terrible virus that we're confronting, it seems to me that it may be that we're ha that religion is actually becoming more visible in public because some of the activities that happen behind the closed doors of houses of worship are actually spilling out onto the internet in worship services that are being broadcast online um, in sometimes um, I've seen uh, various Jewish minions that are happening outdoors um, in uh, service activities of religious groups and others that are perhaps more high profile than they would have been in the past. So that's an interesting thing for us to talk about too. Is this a kind of, as we're secluded in some, some pretty uh, you know, stringent ways, but is it the case that we're actually seeing more religion becoming more publicly visible to a degree um, during this pandemic? Um, well, let's start with the first C that I mentioned, the confusion. What is some of the confusion? What are some of the sources of confusion? I think sometimes we see that um, people just have a, um, an uninformed understanding of our First Amendment. They think that the Supreme Court has kicked religion out of public life, that um, students can't express their faith in public schools, and um, things like that the president can't talk about his or her religion in public. And none of those things are true. Um, the First Amendment says that, generally speaking, the government can't promote religion but it also says the government has to protect the rights of individuals and organizations in expressing their faith, including in public life and in many cases on government property. So um, actually I don't have a, I should have pulled out a copy of my book um, because on the front cover of my book, you can see that there is a picture of a protest happening on government property. It's actually a protest of religious leaders, women clergy and other women leaders of faith protesting the family separation policy. As you will recall, the policy that ended up separating families from one another um, when they were undocumented at, at our nation's southwest border. And a bunch of women came together, uh, women of faith and clergy came together and on an equal access basis uh, got permission uh, to have their protest right in front of an agency of the Department of Homeland Security in Washington, DC. And so if you look on the front of my book, you could see that picture of the women clergy with microphones uh, speaking to that issue and protesting and then the little seal of the uh, agency of Department of Homeland Security right behind them. So that's just a way to remind us that religious organizations like all other organizations uh, can express their faith on government property in public life on the same basis, you know, uh, standing on level ground on the same basis. So that's something that's often misunderstood and needs to be addressed. And then we also have great misunderstanding about public schools and religious expression. Yes, we do have decisions by the Supreme Court saying that public schools can't organize or sponsor prayers. And some of those decisions can be um, a little bit controversial. They certainly were very controversial when they initially came out, but um, they can continue to be a little bit controversial in some of their factual um, you know, scenarios. But, but what we also need to remember is that it's long been agreed that students can express their faith voluntarily at public schools. They can pray over their lunch. They can have um, if they're in secondary school and they want to have a Bible club meeting or other sacred scripture uh, study after school on the school premises, they can do so. But it's if a public secondary school and a bunch of non-curriculum clubs are allowed to meet, like the chess club, then you know the the Muslim club or the or the Jewish club or Christian club or some interfaith club or otherwise that's uh, religious can meet on public school property. And um, just to hit one other often misunderstood uh, example that I mentioned at the top, it is not the case that government officials, high ranking government officials here I'm thinking of, 
uh, cannot speak about their faith in public life. Um, in fact, I teach a course on uh, religion and public life in at Wake Forest University uh, School of Divinity. And one of the things I do is play for them uh, remarks of various presidents, uh, video clips of various presidents referring to their personal faith. Now, I think that this makes sense because we ask our presidents everything from what's their favorite food to how they grew up, um, to the music that they like, why should you know their personal religious beliefs be the only thing they can't talk about? Of course, that, that doesn't make sense. At the same time, it's very important for all government officials to make clear at all times that they support the right of every American to practice their faith or to practice no faith at all. And you can imagine some remarks, and, and certainly we've seen some in, in the past, where a president or a, a candidate for the president would talk about uh, faith in a way that would seem to be inconsistent with the spirit of the constitution. And by that spirit, I mean the idea that under our constitution, there are no second class faiths and there are indeed no second class citizens. So we don't have, uh, we should never have a president talking in ways that seem to um, denigrate uh, one faith or people of, that do not um, have a religious affiliation or claim religious beliefs. So that's some of the, the areas of confusion and I'm happy to talk about any areas that you've encountered uh, that you'd like to raise. Secondarily, what about controversies? Well, we know that there are a lot of controversies in this area. We only have to open our newspapers usually to see some of the controversies. Now, those controversies include everything from um, pre a lot of pre-pandemic issues, and that would include issues where um, religious liberty rights or claims are being made um, that are in tension with other human rights, like the rights of people who are um, LGBTQ people. And some of those issues can be uh, fraught, and I'm happy to talk about uh, if, if you wish how we're trying to manage those issues, it's my own view that we can and must find a way for all of our rights to coexist as a family of rights, a family of human rights. Um, but sometimes that can be um, a difficult area to manage. Uh, we also see during um, this Supreme Court term that we have some cases before the court that involve some controversies. And one of the cases involves the contraception mandate of the Affordable Care Act uh, that's coming up soon for oral argument. Um, if you are like me, then you know that this issue has been fought over for years. And um, so we'll see what the Supreme Court says about it. But this basically um, concerns a provision of the Affordable Care Act that requires most employers to provide their employees as part of their health plans with cost-free contraception coverage. And some, there are some religious objections by some employers to providing that coverage. And during the Obama administration, uh, without belaboring this issue, I will say that President Obama tried to find um, some common ground here uh, where the objectors for religious organizations didn't have to provide this cost-free coverage, but the women working for objecting employers still got this coverage from others, like an insurance company or a third party administrator. And that, uh, that kind of effort to solve the issue did not, uh, was not satisfactory to everyone. So lawsuits continued. And now we have a new policy under President Trump, which basically allows any um, publicly traded for-profit organization, not just religious organizations, but any publicly traded for-profit organizations or, um, or closely held corporations to say we object for religious reasons to providing this coverage. And um, there is no uh, requirement that women working for objecting employers be, would receive this coverage that they're entitled to under federal law. So that's certainly an, an issue of um, controversy. Another issue that's before the court involves the minist what's called the ministerial exception. 
And some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this idea. This is uh, the idea that um, a religious community can make employment decisions regarding its ministers without any kind of state regulation or interference. So this would allow, of course, a Baptist church to hire a preacher, preacher rather than a rabbi and a Jewish synagogue to hire a rabbi rather than a Baptist preacher. Um, but there are arguments about how far that exception should extend. Um, and so there are a couple cases before the court that involve some teachers at religious schools and asks whether these teachers should be treated as ministers and thus not uh, the, the religious organization can make decisions about their employment without regard to non-discrimination law or whether they should be treated as um, non-ministers and thus be able to benefit from the provisions of non-discrimination law. So those are just a couple of things to, um, to watch for. There are other Supreme Court cases in the pipeline too. In fact, we have probably, I think as many Supreme Court cases, I think there are seven in the pipeline right now for this term and next. And frankly, that's the uh, high water mark for the number of church state cases that I've seen um, come before the court in, um, in a, a given term. And uh, so that's something that uh, we'll be hearing a lot more about in the days to come. Then um, another area of controversy that we've seen just in the last week's news or so is about bans on religious gathering, on gatherings generally, which would include religious gatherings as part of the social distancing that we're doing under COVID-19. And there've been some lawsuits, including some that, uh, you know, were initially acted on over the weekend about, not about in-person gatherings, although there are also some, um, some controversies about that, but about drive-in worship services. Now, I don't know if all of you are watching this, but there have been some congregations that have decided that if they cannot hold in-person gatherings in their house of worship, then they'll ask everybody to drive into the church parking lot, for example, and um, everybody to turn on their car radio to a particular frequency where they can hear uh, a minister uh, giving the sermon. So, and, and you know, doing some singing and, and other parts of a, of a regular kind of service. So the question has been raised whether that is um, permissible under various orders that have come down either from the state or from a county or city. And this weekend, uh, a templar temporary restraining order was, um, was issued against a drive-in service that was scheduled and, and indeed took place on Easter Sunday in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, because the judge said that his understanding was that there was a prohibition on that drive-in service and that that was inappropriate because there were no prohibitions on people parking together at the liquor store, you know, and out in the parking lot or in the grocery store. Now, there are debates about whether that's, those are the proper comparisons, but that's the one he was drawing. And he said, so that's treating religious services worse than, in his view, comparable services. Now, we've since uh, heard that the mayor of Louisville was not, uh, never, in his view, he never was attempting to uh, issue any kind of order against these services and indeed thinks that they can take place as long as social distancing is respected. But those are some of the other controversies that we're seeing kick up, not just in Louisville, but in other places around the country. And I'm happy to talk about those if you wish. Um, how do we balance the, I think, com obviously compelling interest in prohibi prohibiting the spread of this highly contagious disease while respecting religious liberty? And I think, you know, in my view is that, um, to put it simply, that government does have a compelling interest in requiring, uh, you know, that gatherings of a certain size don't happen across the board. Uh, but there are some interesting wrinkles on this, including the drive-in church service uh, or worship service that I just mentioned. Well, let me close out my remarks with just some references to common ground. Even though we have lots of fights in this area, we, ha we do have common ground, thank God. Um, and, uh, you know, 
I think that what I mentioned at the top working with the Rumi Forum and others, what, what we often find common ground on in the religious community is serving people in need. And so, you know, when President Obama set up this office of faith-based neighborhood partnerships, one of the great things that I experienced was the fact that we could have people who disagreed mightily on any number of things, including on any number of things with President Obama, but nonetheless said that they want to work with government to serve people in need. So, you know, we work together um, to make sure, for example, that children who receive free and reduced lunches during the school year at public schools could receive them in the summer as well on alternate sites. Um, and uh, that's something that, you know, I, it's hard to find anybody who disagrees on that. And we've could come together around service activities like that. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, also, for the most part, I think we find religious communities coming together around a very serious problem that we have these days. And that is uh, discrimination and hostility toward religious minorities or ethnic or racial minorities. Um, thankfully, for the most part, we see religious organizations taking a stand against fear mongering on you know, any kind of basis, including religious, uh, the basis of religion or ethnicity or race or sexual orientation. And uh, certainly we need that today. We've seen just during the virus that there's been an outbreak of hostility toward um, Asian people, people of Asian descent. And that's, of course, totally unacceptable. And we have seen um, many wonderful coalitions of people across faiths and beliefs standing together against um, discrimination and hostility on these grounds. And I'm afraid we're going to continue to need to be very active in that space because um, you know, this crops up and uh, from time to time, I know when I wrote my book, one of the things I was most concerned about uh, were attacks on houses of worship, whether they were predominantly African-American congregations or whether they were mosques or synagogues. Uh, we unfortunately had seen hate crimes just spiral. And uh, so we, I think we have a real um, serious call to action needed here to make sure that we protect every American and that we get people who are on the sidelines of this debate. And I think there are a lot of people on the sidelines of this debate that may lament you know, the kind of hostility that we've seen, but haven't yet spoken out, that we activate them and, can, and make sure that we make it clear to them that this is a matter where lives are at stake. You know, People have died because of the hostility that has been directed to them simply because of the way that they practice their faith. And we do not have a, a country with religious freedom if we cannot practice our faith without fear. So these are some of the issues that are much on my mind these days. And um, of course, there are many others that I haven't mentioned that you may be encountering. So I just want to um, close here with uh, my remarks and oh, you know, open it up for your questions and comments and say again how much I appreciate the work of the Rumi Forum and bringing us together. And I appreciate all of you for taking time and your very busy schedules to discuss these issues. So thanks. Thank you so much, Melissa. I really appreciate um, your opening remarks and just wanted to encourage everyone here um, on the Zoom uh, to add your questions for Melissa in the chat box. And I will be moderating and asking her the questions as, as we move forward. I just, I just wanted to start um, with um, a question from Bruce Cameron, who asks, uh, the Office of uh, Faith-Based Partnerships has been set aside in the recent administration. Um, has, um, has Vice President Biden or any other, well, actually now we know that it's, um, but uh, you, you wrote any other Democratic candidate addressed the <laughs> issue of the need for a government-wide approach to faith in public life. Great. Well, it's great to hear from my friend, Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Um, Bruce, I hope you won't mind me saying that Bruce did a very nice thing 
um, during the Obama administration. You may, some of you may recall that President Obama made remarks each Easter and Bruce put those remarks together in, in a booklet and some of, with his own reflections on the remarks. Bruce is, it's a Lutheran, you're a Lutheran minister, right, Bruce? So anyway, that's a lovely little booklet and I, I keep on pressing uh, for ways to, for us to get that out to more people because it's such a nice publication that I was able to cite in my book and, and it was fun to meet Bruce and his family at the White House when they came by several years ago. So good to see you today too. Uh, so yeah, so um, uh, yeah, President Trump has not, um, the office that I ran no longer exists. Um, there is something called the Faith and Opportunity Initiative. Um, some, there are some centers for faith, for faith and opportunity uh, initiatives in the agencies, but I don't have a lot of information about what they're doing. Um, some of them I know what they're doing, the HHS office, I see a little more activity there about certainly during the pandemic and some other things, but I don't have a lot of information about the other, um, the other what's going on in the White House or otherwise. But um, Vice President Biden, um, I don't think he's spoken to these issues yet. Uh, but I, I expect that he would. He is, as you all know, a very serious person of faith, a Catholic. Um, and he was always, in my experience, working for the administration, took a, a huge interest in the collaboration of government and religious organizations uh, well, in any uh, respect, but including those serving people in need. So, you know, he was, he, you didn't have to ask him ever <laughs> to get involved in these issues. He was always asserting an interest and his staff was always there um, to discuss these issues. And indeed he would himself raise issues that uh, that perhaps we hadn't seen, he wanted us to consider. And people from the religious community, he wanted us to be sure we met and worked with. So he is somebody who gets these issues and um, and I, I expect that he will speak to them. Um, although I'm not, I'm certainly not, um, you know, saying that uh, with any specificity, I wanna leave it up to, to his campaign when he speaks to them. But I know that he cares deeply about these issues and he's lived his whole life working with religious communities so that it's kind of, you know, like breathing in and breathing out. Um, and it's the way he governs. So uh, I, I would expect that he would have a lot of very considered thought um, and a, a lot of uh, thought that comes from his heart because he cared that's that's where his heart is with um, faith communities and, and serving people in need more generally. Exactly. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, you know, you spoke about this in your opening remarks about the pandemic. Can you uh, talk about some of the additional challenges or controversies you see um, uh, the country having with the First Amendment under this current pandemic world and pro probably post-pandemic world? Hmm. Okay, that's a good question. So I've already mentioned all the gathering, you know, bands. I think uh, we, we're going, things are happening almost, you know, hourly in the development of those. You know, we moved from the questions about in-person gatherings and then to the drive-in services. Um, and I think we're going to see that play out for a while and then it's going to morph when we have actually some reopening, then those issues will reassert themselves because then, you know, we'll be asking about whether, you know, there is an allowance for religious communities to get together to a certain extent again as things reopen. And, you know, these are, these are tough issues because on the one hand, we want, we're obviously, we have a pandemic. We have, I don't know how many of you read the case um, involving a choir in the state of Washington mm -hmm. that met with social distancing happening. And yet 
people died as a result of having gone to a choir rehearsal mm -hmm. and, um, and many others got sick. So these are very serious issues. And I think we, I'm, I'm so proud of, so, of the religious community that for the most part has done, you know, turn on a dime, which all of us know who are religious communities is not something the religious communities always do, but we turned on a dime at the time of a season of holidays like Passover and Easter and Ramadan that's coming upon us and um, shut things down in the interest of protecting life. And so, but I think we're gonna continue to see challenges as, as things open back up. How do we open up that valve without you know, creating, God forbid, gatherings that pass this virus and create another spike. So how do we do that? Those will be issues. There have also been some issues debated about um, the CARES, under the CARES Act. Some of you may be familiar with the Paycheck Protection Program, where um, small businesses and nonprofits can take out loans and then those loans, and I believe they're low interest loans um, managed by the, or, or at least overseen in part by the Small Business Administration. And then those loans can be forgiven or at least some of them can be forgiven. So some questions have arisen about whether, you know, those loans and can be forgiven when the money would be used to pay for clergy salary and the like for explicitly religious activities. And um, there's been some discussion about that. Um, and also I think um, some have raised concerns. Well, if there's any selectivity in the loan forgiveness program, you would not certainly would never want there to be a preference for some faiths over others in the forgiveness aspect of that. Now, you know, I, I hope that that, and I'm not saying that I expect that to happen, but that's something that you always have to be aware of to the extent there's any selectivity. So those are some of the um, pandemic uh, church state issues that are being raised um, and arguments have been made uh, both pro and con on uh, those uh, that church state aspects of the loan forgiveness program, whether that would be consistent with the First Amendment or inconsistent. Um, but I think those are the two main issues that I can think of that are being raised. I think uh, circling back to the first issue, I think one thing I'm mindful of too is that some people, either because they don't have, you know, good internet service, um, they can't do online streaming of their services, or because in the case of some, I think some Orthodox Jewish practices that they cannot practice their faith in certain ways online. Um, and then things like the um, observances of the Eucharist uh, that cannot happen when people aren't gathered in a certain way, at least as the, as the Catholic faith is interpreted um, by at least some, if not, if not all. So those things are things I think we have to be mindful of. And to the extent that, you know, we have a, a kind of lockdown situation that goes on for a long time, how do we attend to those um, as best we can? Uh, while always recognizing that, again, I think the state has a compelling interest to the extent, um, you know, this, this, this continues without, this COVID-19 continues without um, widespread testing and tracing, which we just don't have now. Um, so, uh, you know, those are things that we're going to have to continue to sort through. And I hope that what will continue is a spirit that that we've seen for the most part, which is one of cooperation and creativity. Um, and um, so we'll have to, I just flag those as things, you know, that they're not problems for me as a Baptist, uh, but, you know, religious liberty is religious liberty for everybody. So how do we be attentive to people who are really having to say, you know, I just can't, I cannot avail myself of some of the ways that other people can avail themselves, other manners of pra practicing my faith that others can use. So, so how do we work through those problems while protecting not only the lives of our own congregation, but everybody who, who might come in contact with us? 
Thank you, Melissa. Um, and we have a question from Ibrahim from the Rumi Forum. Um, he's asking, uh, just curious, are you familiar with the book uh, by my colleague Jacques Berliner Blah, Thumping It, regarding the significant use of religious and biblical language by politicians? Uh, it's by Ori Soltis. I'm just forwarding the question <laughs> by uh, Ori Soltis. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, in that last part, I didn't quite get the book by Jack Berliner Brow on the rhetoric, religious rhetoric of um, presidents and maybe other government government officials. Yes, yeah, so significant use of religious and biblical oh, okay. language by politicians. Oh, I haven't it's, read Jacques' book on this topic. I would love to see it. Um, I, you know, I have kind of an amateur historian's interest in these issues, so I'm sure Jack, Jack has done a, a bang up job with it, and I'd love to read it. Um, and, you know, it is one of the things that I enjoyed so much in working on my own book was going back and looking at some of the wonderful rhetoric of of Washington and Jefferson and Madison on these issues, not to the exclusion of others, but um, but they, you know, they stand out. Um, and one of the one of the things that I love so much um, quoting is the letter from George Washington to Turo Synagogue um, that we all remember. Uh, it started actually George Wa with George Washington borrowing a phrase that one of the leaders of Turo, Turo Synagogue wrote in their letter to Washington when they said um, we should give uh, to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. And um, so Washington adopted that phrase. Justice Kagan has commented on this. She said, Washington was a good enough politician that he knew a phrase, good phrase when he saw it and he knew to uh, just take it over himself, <laughs> which he, he did. And he pronounced that in the United States that we should of course never give to you know, bigotry, any sanction to persecution, no assistance. And we need those words as much today as, as, as we did in his time. And um, he also has this wonderful phrase that he uses from scripture talking about that in, in the United States and, and you know certainly everywhere, I would say, um, everyone should be able to sit under their own vine and fig tree with none to make them afraid. And um, so that, those are some of the goals of our imperfect founders. Um, they laid out some extraordinary principles that they only realized in part in their lifetimes, but those are principles that we continue to strive to um, live up to. And um, that's certainly an, an ongoing task. Most definitely. Thank you, Melissa. We have a question from Mustafa. Um, do you expect people to be more tolerant to see people practicing their religion in public life openly, especially after Corona? After the oh, that's a great that's a great question. You know, I think that sometimes the crises we tend to go to our priors, if you will. And if you didn't like religion, then you don't like it even more now. And if you did like it the, before the pandemic, you like maybe you like it more now. But you know, I've seen some people say that uh, religion is part of the problem here. It's it's you know it, it's outbreaks have been associated with religious community sometimes, and. That's true, uh, you know, that that, that has happened. Um, but it's also true that I think the vast majority of religious communities um, have taken this very seriously. And as we talked about earlier, turned on a dime and uh, adapted and tried to reach out and are performing really incredible service to people in their communities. So, you know, I think it, it may be um, a little of both. Um, and certainly I don't mean to say that religion is always, uh, we're always living up to our best selves when we are religious people and in religious community. We can all think of times when we have fallen short as religious communities, when we have caused harm, when we have not, um, loved our neighbors as ourselves. And so there's certainly both instances where you can say that there's been harm uh, brought on behalf of religious communities as well as good. But I think at least th those who would say, you know, well, religion has been harmful. I hope that they maybe would see during this time uh, some of the good that is happening um, because of religious communities reaching out. Certainly, 
religious communities have always played a strong role in caring for the most vulnerable. And quite tragically, you know, the number of vulnerable people in our country and around the world is exploding. And so it's going to call on all of us to, whether we're religious or not religious, to, you know, really figure out how do we do more to help people who are suffering. And so I, I guess that's kind of a prayer and a hope that what religion will be known for as we move our way through this chapter will be sacrificial giving and uncommon sensitivity to the suffering of others and responses that were that are redoubled um, in in terms of their magnitude. So that's again my prayer and hope. Yes, it's become a compassionate nation, most definitely. Absolutely. Um, here we have a, a question from Bob Mosher. He asks, um, I wonder as we move into a high number of people in our country who prefer to identify themselves as spiritual rather than religious, will religion in public life become less important than efforts to regulate spirituality in public life by our government? Spirituality is usually less organized by definition than religion, but could still impact public life and create controversies where new lines would have to be drawn, such as my spirituality requires me to defend um, uh, myself with powerful weapons or oh. our spirituality mm -hmm. rejects certain civil duties. Would we need a new amendment or just extend yeah. religion to be understood as including spiritual identities and practices? Oh, that's a great question, Bob. It's nice to hear from you. Um, so who knows what the future holds? And I'm always mindful that those who predict the future and look in the crystal ball have to eat glass <laughs> in the future. <laughs> so um, I'm going to be careful here, but I'll try to say a few words. I think that our, um, our first amendment, first of all, read now is read very expansively. So the first, the Supreme Court and other courts have said, you don't have to belong to any kind of identified religious community um, or, and you can even disagree. You can say you are seven day Adventist or you're Jewish or Muslim, but you don't agree with most of your, most of your co-religionist about how to practice your faith. You believe this other thing about how to practice your faith. And the courts won't say, oh, we're not gonna listen to your first amendment claim. They say, hey, bring it on. Tell us that you're sincerely religious, broadly defined, very broadly defined, um, which I think would include most forms of, you know, a spiritual claim. Um, and that doesn't mean you're gonna win, but it means you can make a claim under the first amendment as long as it's sincere. Now, again, uh, you do doesn't mean you win the government looks at it depending on which test and which laws apply in various ways and you you very well may lose but um, I think we define the first amendment pretty broadly right now in, in terms of um, including those who would express a spiritual but maybe not a you know a, well they may not call it religious but they or they might say that we're not I don't attend a religious community and I belong to a religious community, but these are spiritual beliefs. I think the Supreme Court would probably, and other courts would try to entertain that uh, as a claim that could be made under the First Amendment. I think in the, what, what one of the controversies is now, what about a claim of secular conscience? You know, one that says, uh, not spiritual, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not asserting anything religious at all. I'm asserting a claim of secular conscience, secular conscience against, um, you know, if we think back decades serving in the military um, and indeed a, a kind of secular conscience was recognized there. Uh, but I think that with more people expressing no religious affiliation these days and those numbers are growing often called the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, as opposed to <laughs> N-U-N-S. And um, there's pressure uh, to read the free exercise clause in a way that would um, dignify those claims as well. And I think we're gonna see more activity there. I think some activity is, going, is already going to be seen as within 
the ambit of the First Amendment. And I think we're going to see more pressure to have more protections uh, provided for people who assert merely, not merely, I don't mean merely in a pejorative way, but merely meaning exclusively secular conscience claims. Now that will raise one interesting question. And that is that, you, as you know, the first 16 words of the First Amendment are Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. If something of secular nature, uh, is recognized as a free exercise right. I don't want, um, I do not want to pay taxes for a, a secular reason for, um, for things that would pay for oil pipelines or I'm just making up stuff or I don't want to, um, I have a secular objection to, um, to, you know, allowing or paying for uh, certain, certain kinds of defense programs or something like that. Now I'm raising tax claims, which are, let me just say, those are particularly complicated for other reasons. But to the extent we have secular claims being recognized as a free exercise claim, then the question can be raised, well, do we also say that the establishment clause um, has to guide or bar against government establishments of secular conscience because there's only one word in that First Amendment of religion. It says establishment and free exercise of religion. So does that mean that we have to guard against establishments of some kind of secular nature, which of course would cause havoc in our government, which we think of as being a secular government? Um, and doing sex. So I think there's a tension there um, between, uh, you know, trying to say that uh, the government shouldn't establish religion. Um, it would be difficult to read that in that clause in a way that would prohibit things beyond religious establishments. I don't say that this can't be worked out in some you know, lawyers' minds and the like, but I just raise it to say it's an interesting question because religion only appears first in the First Amendment. So are we going to define religion differently as for free exercise purposes? And if so, what impact does that have on the Establishment Clause? My initial inclination is to say, I feel more comfortable with treating religion specially on both ends, um, recognizing free exercise clauses, free exercise of religion, but also saying that the government shouldn't prohibit, uh, shouldn't establish religion, but it can, it shouldn't, it shouldn't favor or disfavor religion, but it can take all kinds of positions on secular issues. Um, and so it's more complicated than that, but I just mention it because, hey, we're here to talk about issues and that's kind of an interesting one to think about. Most definitely. Uh, I know you spoke about um, teaching divinity at Wake Forest. Are you teaching that course now? And I am. how is it being affected by um, <laughs> well, you you know, know, moving I've, from offline to online? I've been thinking about that, Jamia, because I ha we have decided at Wake Forest that we're doing all asynchronous teaching. Those of you who teach know what I mean, that you recording your lectures and your students don't have to be on Zoom as we are now with all these wonderful faces. So I have found it incredibly challenging um, to speak to the students through recorded lecture because here I can see your faces and that helps a lot. I'm not with you in person, which would be even better, but seeing your faces matters. And it's just reminding me that the recorded lectures are a challenge. I wonder if any of you are having the same experience. Um, it's not my favorite mo mode of teaching, but you know, um, I understand. I think it. I think it was the right thing to do because students, you know, their lives have been thrown into chaos, and um, a lot of my students have families and jobs and um, jobs that they're being, you know, that they may not have, you know, in a couple of months. So, you know, I think it's it was for good and and sufficient reasons that that decision was made, but that doesn't mean that it's not hard to do recorded lectures. <laughs> yeah, definitely sounds like an equitable decision. Yeah. Looks like we've got a, a question from Talia. 
um, she asked, do you think uh, or know of any instances where there is an equally rigorous and passionate debate about worship in the privacy of one's home or vulnerable space as opposed um, as the, as opposed those that are still are adamant about demonstrating worship in public. I ask because I have felt a seemingly external fixation of worship rather than the internal examination of a person of faith in isolation. Thank yeah. Um, I, so is a question about whether there are debates about that internal. Um, I, I guess, let me just try to make a stab at it and you can help me if I'm not getting it right. Uh, but I think there has been this debate about well, what is worship? What is what is being a church? You know, is is certainly I believe uh, that for me, church is not a building. Uh, it's you know, it's who we are. It's what we do. Um, and so, um, for those who, whether it's a mosque or a synagogue or a temple or house of worship, uh, what did those mean to us? And how how do we actually live out our faith? um every day and so for that you know I, i'm not grateful for anything about this virus but um i think it's a good thing to be you know in dialogue about these questions what do they mean and um what are the parts of uh, the kind of traditional worship that we've done that are essential and what are the parts that can be reimagined um, and carried out in other ways and maybe they've reminded some of us uh, you know and i could include myself in this, who have, uh, you know, what are the spiritual disciplines that we can practice on our own, that maybe we've gotten a little lazy and, you know, relied on others to help us and guide us through that. So can we deepen our own faith during this time by, um, you know, trying to practice spiritual disciplines at home more often and, and practicing them in the family setting more than we might normally do? Um, I think that that's been uh, something that uh, I've certainly thought a lot about, and I've been glad for the public dialogue about it as well. So, you know, uh, I'm glad for that question. Thank you, Melissa. Um, Talia, did you want to add anything to that, or was that a clear enough answer? Okay. Um, Yes, she thanks you very much. Um, um, Ibrahim, did you want to weigh in? I know we only have about eight minutes left, it looks like. Thank you very much, Melissa and Jamia, and to all our participants. Uh, thanks for this uh, uh, talk, which has been a, a great input in our ever ongoing effort to find that very common ground uh, <laughs> and effort that will not uh, you know seem to cease there's always no shortage of need for that and thanks for the curiosity and those insightful questions helping us calibrating the debate and trying to look for those very nuances that really make the meaning and difference so it's been a great evening so i just thank want to thank everyone and having spoken about virtual observations of religious uh, gatherings and occasions. Now we are uh, gearing up for e-iftar programs, uh, trying to reach out to our network to see whether they are interested in spending the first hour of the iftar after the sunset with the Muslim family so that we can match those uh, interested friends with uh, Muslim e-hosts, mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, just a fresh example of what is going on as we try to observe our faith, but still uh, try to keep it a, a way to reconnect. So that's an open call. If there is anyone uh, or any uh, friends, any congregation interested in that, just please do reach out and uh, we'll be happy to uh, arrange those meetings with with Muslim families. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, I look forward to meeting on the during the upcoming coffee night events. And during Ramadan, there will be some slight adjustment in the schedule, and we'll, we're going to bring them to the earlier hours of the day 
but uh, the the circle will continue. Thanks, and I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. So Thanks, everyone. It's been great to talk with you tonight. I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you, Melissa. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Melissa.